Welcome to everybody. Um, as we wait for, for the beginning, we'll kind of allow more people to join here. Feel free to share in the chat where you're from, where you're joining us from, and uh, we're, we're grateful to have you here. I love that it seems that there's a class that's joining us. <laughs> Welcome to our first International Education Week program. Yes, welcome. It's so much fun to see where everyone's from, from right. Georgia to Minnesota to California. It's great to have you all here. Great. All right, and it looks like it's slowing down. So Don, if you want to go ahead, feel free. Well, well, th thank you, Kathy. And uh, for those of you that are just joining us, I see another name just popped up from Atlanta. Uh, welcome to all of you. I'm so pleased to be able to make uh, some introductory comments here in the beginning of this um, particular program on deliberative dialogues. Uh, I'm Don Betts, and I'm serving as the executive director for international programs and global initiatives at ASCU. American Association of State College and Universities. And I'm delighted to be collaborating uh, today with uh, Kathy Copeland, who is the executive director of uh, ASCU's American Democracy Project. <clears throat> and also with Jody Dixon, who is the assistant director of our international education efforts. Um, we're very pleased that you've joined us. Uh, this is International Education Week, not just uh, on this program, but across the world. Uh, and it's a wonderful time for us to be re-emphasizing the absolutely crucial role that international education plays uh, in integrating global democracy into our lives and encouraging that kind of global work. I, I recall many years ago when we were writing our various mission statements at a number of institutions where I had a chance to serve, we kept reiterating the notion that we were there to educate global citizens. And I believe that International Education Week has that mandate to remind us that yes, in educating students uh, and all of us to be more globally aware, we realize that we share a variety of opportunities and a variety of challenges. What I wanted to do just for a couple of minutes is, is to give you a feel or a sense of what International Education Week looks like from ASCU's perspective, because over the past couple of years, we have put together a number of programs and they now have culminated in what we have as International Education Week. And the very first one, again, in collaboration with the American Democracy Project is what we're involved in right now, deliberative dialogue and integrating global democracy in the campus conversation. And I'll return to that in just a moment. But each day of this week, there is a specific program that's going to be highlighting in some way the efficacy of international education. Tomorrow, it's all about Fulbright the Fulbright program, a conversation with Fulbright International Education Administrator Award alumni. It looks really solid. And for those of you that have been on a Fulbright program or aspire to be involved, I can just tell you from experience that it's, an, it's something that you really want to, to pursue. And it really does underline our support of international education. On Wednesday, there will be a student mobility interaction with uh, United States and France. This is a continuation of a very successful program we had last year where over 80 American and French universities found each other in a kind of matchmaking circumstance. Well, on Wednesday, uh, uh, Eastern time from 11.30 to one, we will be talking about shaping sustainable partnerships and encouraging innovative programs. On Thursday, uh, that's France on Wednesday. We go to India on Thursday. A uh, program that will involve the Embassy of India as they begin to explain to us the new, the new economic and particularly the new 
educational policies that are changing the way India perceives its relationship in terms of education with the rest of the world. This is a very much of an evolving circumstance. And I just came out of a conversation a few moments ago with a couple of people at this conference and they were asking me all kinds of questions about India. It seems to be really on the radar of, of so many institutions right now. So that program will be from, um, <clears throat> uh, for, I think it's from 10 to 11 on Thursday, November the 17th, Eastern time. And then Friday, we go back to, um, to Northeast Asia and we have the program on Japan, uh, program development pipeline, something that uh, our colleague Jody Dix has been involved with for many years, the Japan Studies Institute that uh, ASQ sponsors and also the Japan Outreach Initiative, JET and JOI. And that will be available uh, on that date as well. Everything's on the website. What I wanted to point out in giving you that overview is that there was a point in time when international education when in many ways was circumscribed. It was focused on a very small number of countries and a very small number of issues. And we learned people's capitals and about their cultures, et cetera. What we know now uh, is that international education is so much broader than that. And that we really are talking about really understanding and appreciating the full dimension of challenge that we face as a human family. And it was back in the year 2000 that the world came together at the United Nations to have the World Summit. And out of it came um, a group of aspirations called the Millennium Development Goals. So from 2000, 2015, these were the goals that the international system set for itself. They were successful enough during those 15 years that they were revisited and reemphasized and revised and we now are in the era of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs that many of us hear about often from 2015 to 2030. And for me, and I think for the UN system, it's about the human family collaborating in order to resolve the issues uh, that it faces, or at least to take the challenges uh, up that are there. The idea of global democracy really, uh, for me, really connects well to the whole UN system. And when you look at two dimensions of the UN system that really exemplify this, the first is the very is the very United Nations Charter. And it starts out, as many of you know, we the peoples of the United Nations. It wasn't we the governments. It's about we the people finding common ground to solve common problems. And then a second um, reference I'll make to the UN as I close has to do with the unique organization that the UN has created. It's 12 years old on Friday. It's another one of those international education opportunities, but it's the United Nations Academic Impact, UNAI, one of those great UN acronyms, UNAI. And the reason why I mention it to you is because it is the only United Nations agency that is specifically designed to connect the international organization with the colleges and universities around the world and with their students and faculty. And I've been pleased to be involved for the last 12 years and could all encourage all of you, if you're not a member of UNAI, to please do so and reach forward. Uh, take a look at what they have on their website. But now let's return, as they say, to the, to the operation of the opportunity at hand. If this is a deliberative dialogue, and we have a chance now uh, for us to look at integrating global democracy into our campus conversations. And I'm gonna turn the program back over with thanks to Kathy Copeland. Thanks so much, Don. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to hear from you and especially to understand the deeper context of International Education Week. Um, we're so glad here at Ask You that we can present a whole a whole week where we get to travel the whole globe to figure out more, more distinctly what we're doing. Um, what I wanted to share about today, and I'll kind of uh, go through our kind of basic slides there is we're going to be diving into deliberative dialogues and speaking about the global democracy. So um, our International Education Division of ASCU um, is partnering with the American Democracy Project, and that's uh, where I'm the director of. Uh, at the American Democracy Project, we really focus on finding avenues for civic engagement um, to allow allow citizens and all students to understand and to have a deeper um, a deeper realization of what their role in the world can be and how they can um, access 
the tools and structures to, to talk about it. So deliberative dialogues has been a way that we've worked um, and, and kind of found different ways um, to, to bring forward. What I'll say is that deliberative dialogues can sometimes be difficult to understand because in our in our current world, we are we see a lot of um, talk and not necessarily a lot of working together. And deliberative dialogues is all about using talk to work together. Um, what deliberative dialogue especially is, is it's a method of thinking and talking together. And um, it really requires that people from a variety of backgrounds um, are trying to seek a shared understanding of the problem. They're not necessarily trying to seek a shared understanding of the solution, although solutions can come into play, um, but they're looking for avenues for action, for avenues to find common ground, and to look for a wider understanding. What deliberative dialogues are not is um, a debate. They're certainly not a debate, and they're not about forcing your opinion on others or about changing anybody's mind. It's about developing the skills within yourself um, to understand others' perspectives and to find a way forward with differing ideas and differing belief systems um, and really have a, a way to challenge yourself to, um, to understand the world and the, and the wider world. Um, so that's a bit of background about what deliberative dialogues are. At the American Democracy Project, um, we've been happy to use the Deliberative Dialogue Institute to uh, bring a more foundational understanding to different groups, um, faculty and staff, but also students, um, to help explain what deliberative dialogues are, to give them tools to do deliberative dialogues on their campuses, and to hopefully find ways to expand it on their campus and into their communities. Um, and the three wonderful uh, ladies that we have speaking to you today are going to give you an example of how, to, of multiple examples of how deliberative dialogues have worked on their campuses or how they hope that they work on their campuses. But I'm really excited that this group um, and I will be able to talk through what we think of um, within global democracy and how that um, and how that can really be hopefully more envisioned by having deliberative dialogues instituted on our campuses. Um, with that in mind, I'll go ahead and introduce our panel because they are three people that you want to hear from, believe me. Um, we first have Maria Luisa Guterres Ferret and she's the head of internationalization and international cooperation department at the Universidad Catacol de Santa Fe, um, that's in Argentina. Um, also joining us internationally from the Bahamas is Walteria Tucker Roll. Uh, she's the chair of the Academic Senate and director of the American Corner um, of Nassau at the University of the Bahamas. And then we also have a member from the states as well, um, from the great state of Georgia, um, Jessica Trailer is Assistant Professor of Psychology at Gordon State College. And I'm excited to have all three of them in the room. Um, we have a couple of different things to share um, about how they look and how they view deliberative dialogues, but also how we're really working together to think through how, deli how deliberative dialogues can be deployed on campuses. And to that, I'm going to put um, all of us on pins so that you can see us more broadly. What we hope, though, is that um, is that in the chat you can start to add in questions um, as they come. We don't have any um, particular time that you that you need to do that, and we're always ha happy to open it up and to add more people into the conversation. Um, but we'll also have time at the end where you can share your ideas, um, share your concerns, but also ask questions of us. Um, we're, we're more than happy to, um, to have a deliberative dialogue with you and, um, and to talk through how we can hopefully make this a broader um, understanding of our campus. So with that in mind, I will start us all off with a kind of similar question to, um, to have you introduce yourselves briefly, um, if it, uh, certainly you as a person are, are more than just your title and, and where you teach from. So I'd love to have you introduce yourselves briefly and perhaps contextualize how your 
the university has used the dialogue process um, in different innovative ways. While you're while you're introducing yourself, you can also introduce your role into deliberative dialogues within there. So um, I'll start with Maria Luisa and then go to Walteria and then to Jessica. Um, and then we'll start deeply into the conversation. Again, for people um, who are joining us as participants, feel free to add ideas and thoughts into the chat at any point. Um, and we're excited to hear from you. Um, so Maria Luisa, can you introduce yourself a bit more deeply and also explain your connection to deliberative dialogues? Okay, thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. My name is Maria Luisa Gutierrez Peart. I'm head of International Cooperation Office Department at Universidad Católica de Santa Fe, Catholic University of Santa Fe in Argentina. Santa Fe is in the middle of the country, about 500 kilometers north from Buenos Aires, so that you can imagine where we are. I've been dealing the international office for eight years. Uh, the department started with me, in fact. And since then, I've been learning how to manage internationalization because I studied law and I have a PhD in, in law. So uh, previously, I was a teacher and a researcher and I, I knew nothing about internationalization, but I am passionate. I am very very, very happy. And I found my vocation working on this department uh, at my institution. And from the beginning, I, I started understanding that um, dialogue is crucial for managing this department, because we need to let disciplines dialogue through internationalization. We need to let different departments at the university dialogue and generate dialogue um, through internationalization. And we need to find dialogue among our partners and us so as to find dialogue nationally, regionally, and internationally. And after that, what we understood is that we must always try to find a comprehensive internationalization that is try to let the local community engage with our work and a dialogue and, and start talking about global issues, taking into account their own ideas and their own problems, because in fact, that is what we must do at, at universities. Academia must have always the, the eye on their needs and on their problems. And that's why we need to talk and to hear what the local community is asking the academia to do, to work on, to solve, to research, and to, and to develop and build new knowledge taking into account those dialogues all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Luisa. And, and I just, I love how the community connections to the university um, is something that all of us deal with. So um, I'm glad that that's brought you there. Walteria. Hello, everyone. I'm Walteria Tucker Roll, originally from a little place called Belle Glade in Palm Beach County in South Florida. Um, but I moved to the Bahamas to work at the University of the Bahamas in 2013. It was then the College of the Bahamas. And in 2016, we chartered the university. Um, the University of the Bahamas then is the premier tertiary institution of uh, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, um, which this in, two, in, in July, of, uh, July 10th of uh, 2023, we will celebrate 50 years of independence from uh, Great Britain. And so we're living in very interesting times here at the university. Uh, we, uh, I am a Spanish uh, professor by, by trade. So my friends are Borges and Carpentier. And I also do Francophone Caribbean literature. And so I have a little bit of Césaire and all that good stuff. But my role here at the university at this juncture is to manage the partnership that exists between the U.S. Embassy uh, here in Nassau and the university 
um, uh, through the American Spaces Program. Uh, we have at our library a beautiful um, two-part space uh, that is dedicated to uh, cultural diplomacy um, here at the university. And so I manage programming, uh, and community outreach uh, to the wider community, not just the university community, community, promoting American culture and interaction between American culture and humane culture. And so uh, for me, it's extremely, extremely um, exciting work to interact with the community, but also to be a part of the administrative infrastructure here at the University of the Bahamas, where we took the approach with, uh, with with regard to deliberative dialogue and how we can incorporate it here, uh, I happened to be one of those lucky people at the CLD uh, meeting last year uh, in Minneapolis to be part of the training um, done by ADP. And so um, I see Kara Lindemann is in the room. She's absolutely fabulous. And Steve Kozer and to the team that trained us at CLDE. And I walked away so intrigued and so empowered from that session um, that not only did I talk about the possibilities for incorporating deliberative dialogue into what I did in my individual classroom or what we could do academically speaking, but I had a serious conversation with my vice president of academic affairs to whom I'm answerable. Um, and uh, we have decided at the University of the Bahamas that if we're going to preach to the community about the importance of um, sort of democratic values, uh, that we needed to start here at the University of the Bahamas, making deliberative dialogue part of the way that we do business internally. And so uh, we are going to host, by the grace of God, as the Bahamians say, um, we're going to host actually a, del a deliberative dialogue institute here at the University of the Bahamas for our senior um, and mid-level academic administrators. Uh, the Bahamas, uh, the University of the Bahamas has three trade unions operating on campus, uh, public managers union, uh, public service union for our staff workers and a faculty union. And so uh, before we get started with the outreach, we thought that deliberative dialogue was the way for us to go in our inreach. So I'll just leave it right there for now. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, and I'm sure we'll have much more to talk about from that top-down approach. But uh, but first, let's let Jessica introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Trailer. I teach courses in psychology and human services at Gordon State College. That's in Georgia. It's in rural Georgia. So we're about an hour from most decent-sized cities. Um, the county that it's situated in has about 18,000 residents, and our college has um, like 3,500 students at this point, so it's, it's small and rural. Um, I am a big fan of Carol Lindemann also, so I found Deliberative Dialogue through ADP um, in the spring of 2021. They put on a Deliberative Dialogue Institute, and, and like Walteria, it, it changed my world. Um, I knew I had found something, and it's one of those things that once you learn it and you start to practice it, you see opportunities to use it all around you. Um, and it just so happened that we were planning a, a summer vacation right after I learned this tool. And we, we, my family used deliberative dialogue to decide where we were gonna go. Um, and it, it's fantastic, right? Like what are the benefits and the trade-offs of all these different options that, that we have? Um, so I, I use deliberative dialogue mostly in the classroom. So I, I jumped right in. Like I said, it, it really did change the way I saw the world. I spent that summer redesigning two courses to institute deliberative dialogue. And in that following fall, I took my intro to psychology course and my human growth and development course and turned them both into deliberative dialogue based courses. So the students spent the first quarter of the semester becoming trained to facilitate dialogues in teams, and then they were partnered with community leaders to figure out, like Maria Luisa said, what does our community need from us? Because we're not here to tell the community what they need. So they worked with their community partners to figure out what issues needed to be discussed and resolved. Some of the things they chose to tackle were mental health. Like I said, I teach psychology, so that, that makes sense. They also wanted to look at education. They're, they were really concerned about the mental health of our young people, but also the reading scores. 
you know, this was right after COVID. We were looking at third grade and fifth grade reading scores and math scores. And the, the students were disturbed by the trends that they were seeing. So they wanted to talk about that. And it, it really, I think it went very well for the students um, because they still asked me about it. <laughs> they say, when are we gonna do another deliberative dialogue? Um, you gotta bring it back. So they went, they went out and had 32 dialogues across the span of two months, these, these teams of students. And it was a lot. Um, and they learned a lot and our community learned a lot. And at the end of that semester, their final project was to create uh, feedback for their community partners, to tell them everything they learned in their dialogue, to give them some actionable steps moving forward. One of their community partners was the chairman of the county commissioners. Um, another one was the director of our family uh, collaborative in the community. So they, they made a big impact uh, across, across our small area but it also fed over into what Don was talking about with the SDGs. We were working on a binational business team um, through IREX with a, a classroom to hook. And some of the conversations got a little bit heated when we were trying to decide which SDG we were gonna work on that would impact both nations, right? Cause we're in different environments. And it was really nice to see my students who had previously been trained in delivery of dialogue to navigate that conversation. I mean, they did it masterfully. Um, and I didn't even have to kick them under the table. They, they just really sort of just, it, it flowed for them. Um, and one more thing, and then I will stop. I, I also had the opportunity to rewrite the curriculum for our local Leadership Lamar. It's a sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. And of course, I redesigned it around delivery of dialogue. So every month they would go to a new location and have a dialogue based on whatever the topic was going to be in that location. So instead of the traditional lecture model where you talk about leadership, where you talk about communication, and you talk about conflict resolution, they actually experienced it through the delivery of dialogue model. So all of that to say, you can use this skill, this tool for anything from planning a vacation to changing your leadership in your community. I love that. And and really what we're going to be doing um, over the next hour or so is talking through, um, you know, what the deliberative di dialogue model is that we're using um, and giving examples, um, but sharing struggles and challenges that we've all seen with it. Um, and again, we invite your comments um, to, to kind of join us in the in the chat at any point. But um, but Jessica, I was really I was struck and, and so much enjoyed how you described how students were really able to bring um, to bring more entities to the table, to bring more ideas and conversations to the table, and to and to broach difficult topics like which SDG should we focus on? Um, you know, with such a plume and and, and availability there. So I wonder, uh, Maria Luisa and Walteria, if you could um, kind of talk about. How you know, which conversations have you had? Um, how does deliberative dialogue help to bring different entities to the table where you are at or um, or that you're anticipating um, where you'll kind of be at there um, so that we can, um, we've certainly seen a few examples from Jessica and I'd love to see more about um, where you both see deliberative dialogues taking the conversation from your end. Well, um, I would say that through many different programs that we've been developing at our university, um, mainly trying to find um, interdisciplinary areas, um, um, we, we could find different ways to involve um, the local community and teachers, students and researchers from our university and from different uh, departments and careers to be involved in uh, global issues. For instance, uh, some years ago, we had a, a program that was sponsored by the US Embassy in Argentina called uh, Public Policies for Local Development. And through this program, we chose five different topics, federalism, mass media, health, 
entrepreneurship and education. And through these five different topics, we could involve the local community and also the students to start learning to, um, to talk from different points of view on how to solve issues related to these five topics so as to try to uh, work towards uh, local development. So the good point is that we could have in different tables people from the local community, that is from the public sector, from the private sector, and from the civic society as well, working together with students and professors from our institution and with international academics, in this case, they were all from the United States, working together to talk and to discuss about these five different topics that were crucial for us. And that was why we selected these five um, uh, topics. So for instance, when we were talking about education, we had the opportunity to have students from education, teachers from education, but also teachers and um, deans from different schools from our local community and people from the government, for instance, from the Ministry of Education. So this, through this deliberative dialogue, we could help our students to start thinking about how to solve these local community problems regarding education. For instance, childhood education or high school education. And having people from the private sector and from the public sector as well could help us to start thinking about possible solutions and linking them together through these dialogues. Yes. I can continue, but I don't know. I, <laughs> Volteria, maybe it's your turn. No, no. Thank you, Maria Luisa. So, I just wanted to harken back to something that Maria Luisa said earlier. She talked about addressing real needs and, and real problems and sort of us really, and then Jessica real, um, talked about us having, you know, the decision, the tools necessary to navigate these conversations. The conversations that we are trying to have in this CDI that we're going to host um, uh, are as specific as sort of we know, I mean, obviously de deliberation is about decisions that you need to make. I mean, you do need to make decisions and you do need to consider all of the voices around the table so that you make a good sound decision. And administratively, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have you know three trade unions operating here on campus. Trade unionism is part and parcel of the way that you do things in the Bahamas. It's very key, uh, it has its roots in the independence uh, movement here in the country and so, Imagining a university without powerful trade unions um, is just not something that even six years past charter from college to university that we're willing to do. And so right now there are conversations that are being had about uh, you know, what does uh, the new tenure and um, promotion sort of schemata look like for a university um, in, in a, that was historically sort of very um, beholden to our trade unions, our faculty unions to fight for the rights of faculty. What do we do now um, when we have an academic senate created by the 2016 um, University of the Bahamas Act that gave power uh, and shared governance to an academic senate and the board of trustees and um, essentially relegates our trade union, faculty union to a special group. How do we have the conversation about who should make these decisions concerning um, how faculty will be evaluated, how they'll be promoted, et cetera. And how do we have them in such a way that we don't have to go to industrial action. And so at the DCI, uh, the players around the table are executives from the union. Um, we have executives from the union, executives from the academic senate, um, and as as well as 
even as high up as the vice president for HR and her team in the room together, um, learning how uh, to talk about these things without having to regress to the adversarial debates of the past, right? Um, we know, I believe that, you know, deliberative dialogue as, as we're interpreting it is really about, we know that there are decisions that have to be made Right, and so this is not about whether or not we make the decision. We made the decision, but we do want everyone to be a part and parcel of the next phase of who we are as an institution. And um, I desire to have all of these people around the table and to be empowered with the same tools that I got as the individual faculty at CLDE. You know, is to make sure that we can uh implement uh the resources that we that we learn at every phase because there is the writing of an industrial agreement that will have to coexist with the faculty handbook that's written by two different people right two different groups right there there is um still a hierarchy in academic affairs and a hierarchy in in, in human resources that have to coexist and have to work on the same faculty problems and so uh we need to hear each other and we need to, to really see sort of where we are from our different perspectives. I think a lot of the times, um, going back to this idea of a top-down sort of approach to governance is that you have a very few people at the top um, that make decisions for these people, large group of people at the bottom. And then the conflict really arises, the, the ability or the, the inability to work together really arises from people not feeling like they're heard. And when people don't feel like they're heard, then they are less engaged or they feel that they have to constantly uh, be in a fight. And it's true, you know, we have a very small country, a very small institution. We have to take care of we things, as we say in the Bahamas together. We have to do this thing together. And so, um, you know, everybody from the union execs to the vice presidents of both academic affairs and HR, as well as our academic deans. Um, they're going to be in the rooms because they are the ones who are going to have to get a, a, a have their finger. That's right, Ashley. All a we is the one. <laughs> so, um, but the academic deans don't need to make in this new stage of the university. We don't want academic deans who have no idea what's really going on at the level of the individual faculty and are sort of just using um, their power without actually taking the time to have these conversations. Of course, any administrator will tell you, we don't have time for all this talking, right? We have to do work. And like Kathy said earlier, sometimes we neglect to see that the work is, the, the conversation is the actual real work, having the conversation. So when we get so up in arms that we can't have the conversation or when, when we don't feel like we're hearing each other, you know, things don't get done even on the administrative sides, uh, because here, at first, it's, if the faculty get up and arms, we can pull an industrial action and withhold grades according to the law, and we can't be fired. <laughs> so nobody wins if we don't talk about what we need. And so we look forward to having the conversations that we've had before and coming to decisions that include perspectives at every level. And that this becomes our new administrative culture. That's what we want from this. So I'll stop there. Just and that's uh, that's so exciting to to kind of think through the various approaches. Um, I mean, from all three of you, I really kind of thank you for sharing what kind of conversations you're hoping to to generate and that you have already generated. What I'm really seeing uh, from our conversation is one that we might want to dive into what the experience is actually like or what it's been like as you've started to to use this more as kind of you know in light of all of the problems that we've been facing um but also i think where we're hoping to go is you know how how do we think it'll help us when we're thinking about internationalization and globalization and empowering students to really um to understand where they fit in the whole piece of of the world, um, and then that, and and also, um, and I think this is perhaps where a lot of our participants will will gain some knowledge of how do you dialogue, um, what resources do you use, um, you know, certainly 
uh, Walteria and Jessica both mentioned the Deliberative Dialogue Institute, um, but how how do you kind of start to gain that? Um, and, and, you know, where can we kind of um, help each other figure that that piece out there? So, um, so I'll kind of start, though, just um, with that experience question, because, I mean, we've had we've had the pandemic, we still have the pandemic, uh, still still very ongoing process. Um, but also, you know, these last years, it just seems like we're navigating difficult subjects one after another. Um, we had um, an election uh, this this past week in the United States, um, which had a very uh, divisive quality to it. And Jessica uh, is, is certainly from Georgia, which will be continuing the election um, into the next month um, because uh, no candidate reached the 50 percent threshold there. So, um, you know, we certainly had the political ideas um, and thinking in South America, we've certainly seen how Brazil um, has moved um, on, on different elections there, too. Um, beyond elections and kind of beyond the pandemic, there's wars around, there's the conflict um, that, that the Ukraine has had to deal with uh, from Russia. And and it's um, it seems that sometimes that the world is, is ripping its part, kind of part itself there. So how do you kind of look towards dialoguing as a way to navigate these difficult subjects? Um, is there a way when you're bringing up dialoguing that you find that it has the ability to, um, to kind of help people look past who to blame and instead find ways to heal? Or, um, or do you just find that it's cathartic for people to have a chance to share their, their feelings, um, even if there's no clear and ready solution that they can, can actually um, do themselves? So maybe we can kind of just spend a couple minutes um, talking through what we think of um, as your experience with dialoguing during these difficult years. So the first dialogue I hosted with my students was in the fall of 2021 on the first day of class. Instead of doing the welcome back, this is your syllabus speech, we deliberated what we should do about masks. You, were, you, you all remember, right? This was a time where people were doing away with the mask mandates, but folks were still wearing masks. And if you didn't wear a mask, then People assumed that you were insensitive to the needs of others. And if you did wear a mask, then people assumed you were some sort of conspiracy theory. Like there were assumptions on all sides of this issue. And the university system of Georgia did away with the mask mandate. Masks were still encouraged, but optional. First day of class, I knew it was gonna happen. Half the students were wearing masks and half of them were not. So that's what we deliberated for an hour. What should we do about masks? As a community, our class is a community. How are we gonna come down on this? And we heard stories about people with autoimmune conditions, afraid for their health, elderly grandparents, afraid for their health. We heard stories from people who um, had allergies or breathing issues and really struggled to wear a mask. We heard people who had some social differences who needed to see the whole face to truly understand the emotions behind what someone was saying. So we heard really good reasons on both sides. And what we came down on was personal responsibility. So there's no solution, right? We're not going to change the policy of the university system. But for our class, the policy we came up with was everyone be responsible for your own personal health um, and for the health of our community. And we talked about what that looked like. So I think that there are ways, Kathy, even if we can't change the world or solve all the problems, I think that there are ways for us in our groups, whatever communities those are, to come away with agreements that work for us and that make our lives better. And what I found is that once people learn this tool, it just sort of infiltrates the rest of their lives. Students who were trained to deliberate dialogues in previous semesters are now modeling that just in class discussion. So it, it really does carry over to the rest of life. For me, one of the things that, I mean, you bring up something very interesting, Jessica, one of the, we have a number of national issues that are going to be on the ballot very soon. Um, here, obviously, the election cycle in the Bahamas, so on a five-year cycle, rather than 
um, uh, the model that we have in the United States. And so when we have, there's a conversation, for instance, one of the hot topics now, is any, uh, well, hot topics related to all things dealing with gender inequality or equality, um, whichever way you wanna look at it right here in the Bahamas. Um, some of the things perhaps that some of you take, it grant, uh, take for granted um, like the ability uh, to pass your citizenship on to your child, whether or not you're married. Um, <laughs> uh, for a Bahamian woman, she cannot pass a citizenship on to her child if the father is not a Bahamian. And so how do we have the conversation in the Bahamas about whether or not, you know, that that's, that's something we want to change, um, especially given the very conservative sort of uh, Christian posturing of uh, the country itself identifies um, po uh, popularly, not politically, not officially as a Christian nation. Um, but here, those are things that we need to talk to. We need to talk to our students in general, and we need to lead conversations as a university with the community about why, um, you know, this, the, the, these issues, a woman's body, her freedom, um, her equality with her male relatives um, is something that we need, to, we need to consider at this point in the 21st century. Um, because uh, you know we have an epidemic of statelessness here um, in the sense that you have children born to Bahamian women who have non-Bahamian uh, fathers who cannot, who can neither be a citizen of their father's homeland nor a citizen of the Bahamas and creates a situation in which they must remain without a citizenship until they must, until they reach the age of 18 at which they are eligible to apply for a Bahamian passport. And so um, the working conditions for these people, the working conditions for them, all of these hinge on whether or not that woman has the right, like the, her male counterparts to pass um, her citizenship on. So these are, these are key issues. Also um, a hot topic right now is the issue of marital rape. We don't have any protections for a woman who is raped in marriage here in the Bahamas, none. Um, all of the rape is a crime in the Bahamas, just not if you are married. Um, and so there is a conversation being, or there have been debates, um, but perhaps using these techniques allow us to talk about, um, you know, what, what, what marital rape is or something even more fundamental than that. Does it even exist? And can it happen within the confines of marriage? Is it, a, is it an oxymoron, as some have argued? Because we do, we know we have to make a decision um, we know that there are things that there are women being brutalized. We have statistics that show that women um, are self-identifying as being brutalized, increasingly so since the pandemic. Um, that gender-based violence has has gone to an all-time historical high here in the Bahamas, and there are no protections for the people who are letting us know. We finally have a voice in the statistics. We don't have laws to protect, but before we get there, we must have conversations publicly about why these things are important. Have them here at the university um, uh, to talk about why they're important because as, as Maria Luce have pointed out, these are real problems in a real society. And if we don't talk about them, then we can never even hope to get to a solution. Um, I, I think, I think uh, you know, we have enough examples, I will use an opposite, we have a history of examples at which there have been public debates on these issues and they have not ended um, well, and they have not ended um, in humanizing the people in the conversation. They often descend into these things uh, where these nasty sort of clashes where people are denigrated for their views. Mm -hmm. And this is the moment where we have to say, no, you know, there is another way, there's a better way. So we look forward to being able to change that to implement these practices. Well, I would say that um, teachers, faculty have, um, a big responsibility in this, because as you, both of you were saying, I would say that class is the best place to let them think, to let them develop the critical thinking, uh, the respect, to the, let them uh, learn a bit more how to 
to listen to other people and to understand other people thinking because I would say that students or young people nowadays they they fall in love with their own ideas they they are so used to to having a look at their phone and and I, I would say that they are getting more um they they are having this narcissism you know and I think that it's very important for faculty and I include myself because I'm a teacher at the university we we must take into account what we can do during our classes to let them talk to let them debate to let them go out from the book you know from the library because and I think that that's the question of changing of culture as well and changing of culture from our point of view as faculty and from from the management as well because i think that what the pandemic uh, taught us is that we we need to understand a bit more how to look at what is going on outside apart from studying from the book so the syllabus is really important but as jessica was saying it is more important to understand what the society, what the community is asking. And when we talk, the, 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 the issue is that when we talk about the community now, we are not talking about the city where we live. <laughs> so that's why we must teach them how to be global citizens. So, and, and that's what's, what the pandemic gave us. To solve a pandemic, we need to talk globally and locally. What sometimes we talk about globally, okay? So, and if we want to solve the problem of the pandemic, we must talk interdisciplinary. Because Jessica was talking about the masks, okay? And Walteria was talking about different other issues related to the pandemic. But sometimes the question is, we must take all the issues into account and that's the way we must teach our students to think to try to pro solve the problems taking into account the different points of view from the different disciplines and the different points of view from the global <laughs> citizenship that is people from china people from the united states people from south america so and, and, and also because the pandemic gave us many tools that we knew that they, they, they were there, but it accelerated everything. So through this, through technology, we could join people from different parts of the world to talk together about the pandemic, to talk together about using or not using masks, to talk about Okay, but we also have to take into account issues related to business, to industry, to, to economy. So what do we prioritize? Economy or, or health or education? People, students being at home, depressed. So I think that it is a great responsibility for faculty to work in their own classes with the students to let them talk to let them listen and learn to respect the other's ideas and that's why i i i'm really fond of internationalization because that means that we can understand and respect and learn from different cultures not only from the people who is sitting just beside me and that We'll go to bed at the same time as I do. We'll go to the to the same pub. We'll we'll eat the same the same food. The, the The good point is that we can connect them with people from different parts of the world and let them understand their own culture and let them understand their own needs and let them understand what they are seeking for. And the good point is that we are we are building and we are raising critical thinking taking into account this global thinking, not only the local thinking, both of them. So I think that it is more than ever a big responsibility for, 
for faculty to 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 think about deliberative dialogues in class involving the local community and involving the international partners in fact when we talk about the the, the united nation um um goals uh, I'm thinking in Spanish, sorry. Um, uh, we we talk about the the, um, the 17th talks about partnership, partnership and cooperation. And that's what we need. We need to cooperate with the one who is just beside us, with the one who is outside the university and with the people who are maybe in a different country. And that I, I, I think that that is the... the the most wonderful thing we we we've learned or we should have learned from the pandemic. I'm so energized by that, and I went ahead and put um, the the SDG goals that um, that we've all referenced um, into the chat there. Um, yeah, no, I'm what I'm excited about is is that you brought up you know how do we teach to be global citizens and thinking that through. And even, um, I mean, to Malteria's point that, you know, it that deliberative dialogue helps force us past the status quo of, well, let's just let's just keep the Bahamian uh, citizen law as as we know it on the book. Let's just keep this, um, you know, let's just continue to be in that tension that that Jessica described of mask or no mask. Um, but by talking things through, by coming at that process, you really get a sense uh, that people can solve problems and that people can find a way forward. Um, I guess, I mean, to that level, like how how would you teach a dialogue? How would you teach to become a global citizen and, and kind of teach in that interdisciplinary um, internationalization sort of mark? Um, and feel free. I mean, um, we've also had some great kind of questions saying, you know, when you're teaching for it, how can you tell that there's actually a difference? So that might be an angle that you decide to take too. Um, but, but yeah, I'm interested. How do you actually teach for this? And, and how do you assess if it has the impact that you're striving for? I think just on a basic level, people start to speak about the issues differently afterwards. If you're having an impact, people are going to, the way that they talk about the situation will change. For instance, one of the other uh, uh, issues here that's hot is the question of abortion and a one's right to an abortion, um, as you can probably imagine, contentious issue as it is. but. And here in the Bahamas, looking at sort of what the midterms taught us about the importance of people's access to this, to the resources and to this right, right, it is, is actually gave us the tools here to have conversations about it. So what we did, uh, what we have done in the American corner specifically, I, I can talk to you about how we've really, how we've addressed issues of gender inequality and using um, outside sort of examples to say, to remind our students and to remind the public coming through the corner, uh, we can have these conversations. And guess what? We're not the only ones having these conversations. So we could show a film that's contextualized in the United States. Um, one of the ones that we did during Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations here, um, obviously Hispanic Heritage Month is celebrated in the United States. And so we showcased one of the films, Entre Nos, um, at uh, the Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations here. And we used it to have both a group of immigration officers who were being trained on um, the principles of migration reform, as well as our uh, students in our beginning Spanish level sequence. So we had two different groups come in, watch the films, and then we had conversations with them about the topic of the character um, actually ends up, she's abandoned by her husband, and uh, in, in some major city in the United States, she doesn't speak English very well. She doesn't have a regular job and she finds herself pregnant. And so through that very human experience that a lot of our students and even the immigration officers in their function actually related to this very human example and talked about it 
talked about, we're able to sort of project through the film, right? To connect with the character in the film and sort of that filmic adaptation of a national sort of issue, immigrant rights, as well as um, women's rights, et cetera, and, and the whole abortion topic. Having the conversation about the film and then having it, turning it back on, okay, so what does this make us think about what we currently think about this, what we may in the future think about it, and making 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 people realize that some of the problems that we're dealing with are not just national, they are just human, they're human problems. And other human beings have gone through them, other nations have gone through them, um, and other nations also have come up with ways to resolve certain issues and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so we found um, students coming out on, on after that conversation, the conversations after the conversation, after the, the conversation after the, after the conversation was, I understand now why people do this. And I understand now why women fight so hard to have the right to things like this in the United States. And this is whether or not that will equate to a policy, a change in policy here, um, is of less consequence, I think. I think it's about when people start to talk about the issue in a very different way. I think that's that's at least one way that you know. And the immigration offices too, these are people, um, when they saw that story, um, they did talk about how they identified with the character and identified with our set of migrants who are not Hispanic, they're Haitian. They're Haitian migrants who show up here in the Bahamas in similar situations. And they need to encounter that first point of contact, that immigration officer um, could change their experience forever in this nation and their possibilities can impact their possibilities for really accessing all the liberties that we have in the Bahamas. I mean, through that interaction. So just knowing that people are thinking differently and they're talking differently about it is a great first step. And I, I agree with that, Walteria. You, you can see a change in the type of conversation that happens in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And you can, it, it's an entire shift. Um, in addition to that, our college is in rural Georgia, but colleges still have this reputation of being very, very liberal. And so I had a couple of students who uh, were from a pretty conservative area near, near the college. And they both came up to me after class one day, and this is a class that was practicing deliberate dialogue, and they said that they felt comfortable sharing their conservative views in class. And to me, that was a win. That means I've created an environment where a wide variety of voices are welcome in the room. And then in addition to that, like I said, that summer after I learned about deliberative dialogue, I took the deep dive. There's some really good books um, out there about deliberative pedagogy. And so there's one by Timothy Schaefer called Deliberative Pedagogy, Teaching and Learning for Democratic Engagement. And in that book, uh, there is a rubric. There's a Deliberative Pedagogy Learning Outcomes rubric. And for both classes that I taught deliberative dialogue, they had to do a self-assessment at the beginning of the semester and at the end using this rubric uh, to score themselves. And uh, obviously they made gains, right? But the feedback I got from the students was that it would have been interesting to have their teammates rate them on the rubric. So they're, they're looking for a peer review. So I think the next, next semester when I revise this again, I'm gonna add a peer review to the rubric. So then you've got an outside um, perspective on these. And the learning outcomes are very basic. Collaboration, reason giving, synthesis, understanding trade-offs, reflection, awareness of relationships and empathy. So basic things we would want in any citizen, much less a global citizen. So if you're a data person, if you're more of a quantitative uh, researcher, <laughs> that rubric might be one way to look at outcomes. Yes, I would say that, that those are the soft skills that we need to develop on our students. And um, I, I always go back to internationalization because it's, it, is my 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 point um there is a, a great tool coil call coil collaborative online international learning that can help us and maybe i i am answering some of the questions um 
the this this um this tool this internationalization tool that help mainly students who cannot afford a trip and who will not be able to to travel abroad and that's something that um I, I always do the same joke when we manage internationalization we can be a tourist guide or a or a, a tourist agent for those who can travel or we can try to find international experiences for all and COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning, is a great, yes, sign is COIL, is a great tool that can encourage inter, uh, students to connect with other students from different parts of the world in their classes, in campus, that is internationalization at home. So through this kind of activities, we can help them to develop soft skills, critical thinking, and uh, dealing with people from different cultures, understanding other cultures, respecting. And I think that that's the beginning of a real deliberative dialogue. And then we can connect them with the local community, with the civic society. And we, we will be sure that we are developing future professionals with a with an important profile related to understanding others opinion and i think that that's the most important thing that we must uh, let them understand and learn um, and when we understand the other culture we uh, and as Walteria was saying when we understand what the other people is thinking when we are helping them to be to have empathy uh, we will be able to, and they will be able to, to have a real dialogue and to have real debates. Because sometimes they they just talk and they they not listen to to other points of view. I I entirely agree. <laughs> Go on, Walter. Yeah, Kathy, I was going to say just to this point too, because I think sometimes you know what this process does. It shows us that we are also internally diverse. And I, I can't stress that when people start talking, you'd be, you, you'd be surprised how people from the same demographic, you know, I mean, you get a whole bunch of black people in the room uh, and not just not black in general, African-Americans, get a bunch of African-Americans in the room. And if you have them to talk about issues, you're going to find out that when they do all have a chance to speak up, you have this diversity, this range. And I think if we always just, if our assumption is that we are internally diverse, and that is what makes us capable of being so unified and that we're already, you know, this is not a hard thing that we always do this. We are already so diverse in the way that we think. And again, to the point, I guess I'm preaching a little bit here. I think that's what America needs to remember about itself, that the definition, right, is of, of who we are, is that we've had, we are people from many, different places coming together to make this amazing thing that never was. And so it's, 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 I tell students here in the Bahamas because this is an archipelagic nation. So there are 700 islands and keys, right? So when you say, what does it mean to be a Bahamian? When you ask that, it depends uh, perhaps on which one of the about 30 some odd habitable islands that you come from. I mean, so an Abaconian is gonna say one thing, uh, and a person, a Grand Bahamian will say another thing, a Nasuvian will say another thing. And so, but at the end of the day, when you put them all together, uh, there's an express, expression here the Bahamians used to talk about just being kind of a pot cake or a mutt, as it were, but in a loving sort of, of caring man, a manner. Um, we mix up like conch salad. And if anybody has ever tasted conch salad, it is amazing, right? If you have, please do let me know if you've ever eaten Bahamian cock salad. But it's it's it, the taste, the flavor of that sort of national identity when all of these diverse, internally diverse elements come together. Um, it is the essence of what it means to be Bahamian. And I would say too, we need to tell the people in all of the United States, this is who we are is many. Becoming one, not one sort of being homogenized, right? And so even those kids in rural Georgia, Jessica, I'm sure, I'm sure that you are amazed at the things that they come up with 
even in that rural places, it seems so cut off. But it, here in the Bahamas, I tell the students that also the world has been coming to the Bahamas since 1492. So this idea that we're some that purebred Bahamian uh, cut off from everybody else, never touched or infiltrated by any other culture or whatever. No, it's better. That's a that's a figment of our imagination. And considering that 80 percent, um, we have 8 million tourists coming here from North America every year. I think it's safe to say <laughs> that we have, we're, uh, we have always already been globalized. And so thinking of ourselves in any other way, it's just um, it's denying reality. And so talking about these things, recognizing the diversity, gives us an opportunity to recognize our internal diversity and to reaffirm our, our need to be connected with people who are different, all right? It's just, that's, that's a beauty. We need to get back to our roots. Well, Terry, it's, it's, since you called out rural Georgia, I'll have to tell you, I'm in Orlando, which is six hours from rural Georgia, and I'm down here with three students who are going to present with me later on this week. On the way down here, it gave us plenty of time to talk. Two of the students are second generation immigrants from Mexico. And so we had this long conversation about what it is like for them to be immigrants. They still consider themselves immigrants in, in rural Georgia at this time in history. And one of the young men said, that when he went to college and started gaining a more diverse friend group, it, it allowed him to see aspects of himself that he'd never seen before because he had always been trying to fit in with, with his white middle-class friends who had very different home lives than he had. And so to your point, diversity is, is beautiful, not only because we need all of our ideas to come up with a better solution, but because it does, it gives us the freedom to be who we are. And it's, it's really interesting that he explained that today. Um, and then you said it again, it's so important. It is. That was beautiful. And Valteria, I'm, I'm excited to try the conch salad, I'll say that. And I like it much better even as a term than melting pot because melting pot seems to homogenize everyone together. Whereas the conch salad, you have the unique flavors of each individual in there, which I think um, makes it so so kind of fine. I will say we've got um, around 15 minutes left. So if you have questions, do feel free to throw them in the chat. And I'll acknowledge a question that Eric put in, which I think that we've, um, kind of come around to, but but maybe we can, um, you know, even think there, but what kind of successful strategies do we have? He was talking about for the local community, and I think, Marie Louisa, when you brought up um, the COIL strategies, I think that was very helpful there, but, um, but what kind of strategies do we have for either making connections or um, in just that, like, finding support for do doing dialogues on campus? You know, where, where do you think um, you know, how can we kind of continue to build this movement towards talking things out, towards um, towards dialoguing? And and feel free to keep throwing questions in the chat, everybody, too. Well, um, if I can answer that question, what we usually do is when we receive um, faculty, international faculty, and also students, we try to, to find connections with the local community. For instance, we've developed a program on um, um, smart cities this year with Italian universities. And we received some Italian academics who came to our university to give classes. Some of them uh, talking about technologies on smart cities, some of them talking about um, environment, some of them talking about architecture and urbanistic. So, and some of them talking about sustainable development goals or businesses. So in each of those opportunity or indeed in each of those visits, we took the opportunity and we found the opportunity to let them meet with people from the local government and from industries to discuss about business, to discuss about environment, to discuss about policies. 
people from the local government and people from the state, the state level government, as you have states, we have provinces, people from industries and people from the civic society as well, involving always the students and the teachers. The good point of working this way or trying to find this connection is that it helps us to build long-term relationships with the academics who are coming from the United States or from France or from Italy or from Mexico or from Paraguay. Because we give them the opportunity to understand our own issues, our own problems, and to meet people from the local community, from the government, from industry, from the civic society, so that we can promote future joint activities, joint projects related to their own issues and to our own issues involving the local community. So we give the students the opportunity to, to link or to strengthen more links with the local community. We give the international academics the opportunity to link with our local community through internationalization. And we try to start building long-term relationships with joint projects involving our international partners, our students, our teachers, and our local community as well. So it takes a lot of work to Eric's question. It takes a lot of work to build relationships with community partners, and it takes a lot of work to sustain those relationships. Um, so I've spent countless hours over the past several years attending community meetings and trying to understand what it is that our local politicians are trying to accomplish, what it is that they want to know from the citizens that they honestly don't want to host a town hall because it turns into a not so pleasant experience, right? But if students can host a deliberative dialogue for them to hash out some of those issues, Contentious conversations are, are often not contentious in a deliberative dialogue, especially if it's facilitated by students. People are much nicer to students than they, <laughs> than they would be to me. Um, but, but also we, we personally invite them um, to, to attend a dialogue, to see what it's about. And then once the process gets going, I, I let them know how important they are. And the students are there to help them solve whatever problem it is they want to solve. And then the students keep communicating with them throughout the process and they get feedback in the end. So it is not it is not easy. It is time consuming. If you work at a college that has some sort of community engagement liaison or service learning coordinator, um, get with those people. They would be able to help you build the relationships. But if you're just a faculty member who wants to do this, be prepared to put in a lot of um, time and legwork to build those community relationships. I think this is, uh, it's exciting to hear about the different strategies that are out there and, and, and I think acknowledging the fact that this is difficult work, that individual faculty members are putting in a substantial amount of time um, in order to to kind of find the path forward, like you did, Jessica. Um, but also that you know whole communities have to invest in enough time and enough resources to bring this to fruition and to find ways for people to have the conversations. Um, encouraging global citizenship is not an easy task. Um, but I think that universities are designed just for this and that universities can really bring that power. Um, so, I mean, is there, you know, a kind of final thing in the last few minutes that, that you kind of just want to, um, to share about how you think deliberative dialogues can really be a, be a foundation to build global citizenship onto um, or that this really is a way that global citizenship or internationalization can be something that that we that we strive for um, rather than just knowing that we should be um, engaging in these kinds of of uh, reflective behaviors. So 
So I, I would just suggest if anyone is interested in getting started with deliberative dialogue, um, it's definitely worth it. I know I make it sound like it's a lot of work, but it is worth it. Um, and if you don't want to go big and you're not ready to <laughs> have global conversations, um, start with something small. Walter, you mentioned the term earlier of an oxymoron, marital rape. Well, one of the conversations, and you may have that conversation in your classroom, but one that we started with was the idea of compassionate accountability. Um, and I have, I have a 16 year old and he said, mom, those words don't go together. And that was the challenge, right? Like, so what happens when you have too much compassion versus not enough compassion? What if you have too much accountability or not enough accountability? And that can become a deliberative conversation. Anything above and beyond that is, is icing on the cake, right? And so I think once we learn this skill, it really is a skill, it's a tool. Then when students have the opportunity to engage in difficult conversations, whether it be um, about sustainable development goals or about voting rights or abortion or whatever the topic is, they are more prepared to listen for different perspectives, to engage from some place of intellectual humility and to not, not become defensive. So it's just building the skill um, in whatever way that we can. I, I will keep you all posted on our sort of new venture here um, with working with our administrators um, because we do want to start, uh, like I said at the beginning, we're starting internally um, and the challenge after our leaders are trained, after our administrators are trained, um, will be for them, I mean, to be accountable by hosting a plethora of dialogues on a number of different topics relevant to their direct duties or they'll be free to schedule even community outreach if they want to. But the important thing is just to have, have those tools to have the conversations and to bring, I would say, the humanity back into the hard conversations. I think people, um, and to bring I, it for, this is the way that I'm going to express it, to bring humanity back into the way that we administer the affairs of the university. And so, you know, if we could change our institutional culture, I think that we have done a great service. We will have done a great service in modeling for our students um, the type of empathy and understanding that it takes to build a better world. And so, um, stay tuned. We do expect um, great things for us. Um, and by extension, we expect great things for the Bahamas um, and sort of being that light by using these tools. Marie, Louisa, any kind of um, thoughts, especially as you think about, um, you know, can can SDGs and having deliberative dialogues around them help us to find uh, collective survival strategies? Or are there other ways that you can kind of um, see internationalization working um, within deliberative dialogues to, to move the mission of the university further along? Well, yes, I think that um, sometimes we, when we talk about internationalization, the question is, is this, is this the fourth function of universities as teaching and um, research and extension? And I would say that it is not. So internationalization is the dimension. We talk about the international dimension of university we, because through internationalization, we can also help people from that is faculty, researcher, students, and extension connect with each other. And I would say that internationalization is a, an important tool or function or dimension that can help faculty understand that they must work towards building global citizenship on their students. It helps researchers understand that we need to build knowledge, partnering and cooperating with people from different parts of the world. 
And it is important to understand that when we are talking about extension, that is the third function of university, we always must connect with the local community, but with a global point of view. So I would say that building soft skills on students is a strive, <laughs> it's a responsibility, and it's something that we can uh, we can deal with and we can achieve through internationalization, mainly, mainly. And I guess that through technology, we can find many, many different tools and it can help us to understand that although we are diverse, and that's what we, we, we were talking on, Walteri and Jessica were saying, it is funny because usually we, we finally understand that we have the same issues. If we talk about a student of 20 years old during the pandemic at home, not being able to, to meet their friends to go out, outside, some of them with connectivity, some of them without connectivity, we will probably find the same problems for students from Bahamas, from Georgia, from China, from mm -hmm. France, from Africa, from Argentina. So, and if we study psychology as Jessica, probably psychologists will be studying the consequences of the pandemic on these students. And if we are talking about business and we had the opportunity to work with two different universities, one from the United States and one from France, trying to deal with issues related to the pandemic, but inside the businesses, we could realize that businesses from different parts of the world were dealing with the same problems. And how these students being global citizens will be able to solve these kind of issues, working together in intercultural groups and in interdisciplinary groups that is taking into account health, uh, um, social issues, economic issues, environmental issues. And that's what we find on the sustainable development goals. We need these partnerships, we need this cooperation, and we need this dialogue between, among disciplines, among the different roles of the university and with the community as well, to try to, to, to have a better world, because we don't know if we, will, we are going to have another pandemic or something global again. <laughs> you know, that, that's the, the, the big issue. <laughs> and I entirely agree. And uh, I, I mean, I could talk to all three of you for the rest of the day, but recognize um, your time too. But like you were saying, Maria Luisa, I mean, it's really just, I'm glad that we have this almost local community of people who love deliberative dialogues and, and bring it forward, but recognizing that we have this global capacity to to bring it to a wider world, to recognize how that can really add value both to our universities, but to our, our kind of uh, you know engagement within uh, with how we how we connect to people and how we recognize that we all have the same problems we're all striving for um, for acceptance and um, and and rights in different ways so thank you all so much um, I will kind of wrap it up because I recognize everybody's time there but uh, I will send out a recording as well as some of the resources that we've mentioned here. Um, and, and elsewhere too. And I'll say, I put into the chat there, um, International Education Week continues tomorrow. Um, they've got a whole um, wonderful thing about the Fulbright and how to apply for it. So please, even if you think, well, I could never be a Fulbright scholar, you can be. So join there. It's um, it's gonna be really, um, I think a fun way to to invigorate some um, some of the the things that we're doing on campuses and to show that. Um, and then on Wednesday they have a, um, an idea with the the Embassy of France. Um, and then on Thursday, as Don said, they go to India um, 
and uh, and Friday is talking about Japan. So feel free to explore more of those and register and, and join us there. Um, and I'll thank thank Jessica again, Maria Luisa, and Walteria for sharing honestly about how you do this. Um, and and I know that um, that all the people who joined us here are very thankful for you. Um, for sharing your ideas, um, just as I am, but also just for your energy and enthusiasm and finding new and exciting ways to, to look at the world. So thank you from the bottom of my heart um, and um, from everybody at Ask You, um, thank you all participants for joining us. Um, but I will go ahead and, um, and kind of stop the recording and um, I'm really appreciative of all that you have done and all that you will continue to do.